the man known as the Doodler terrorized San Francisco in the 1970s. For nearly 50 years, it looked like we would never know the Doodler's true identity. They walk among us, unassuming faces that mask a chilling darkness. These are the phantom killers, the ones who vanish after striking, leaving only a trail of shattered lives and unanswered questions. The smiley face murders cast a long shadow. Three young lives snuffed out, their bodies dumped in towns that match their initials. Meanwhile, in Austin, Texas, the servant girl Annihilator stalked the streets, leaving a bloody path of victims. These cases remain unsolved, the killer's identities lost in the shadows. But who were these monsters, and how did they vanish without a trace? Glasses that were either affixed to the hood or affixed to glasses underneath. The circle on the chest was, was a perfectly formed circle. Let's go into detective mode and unravel the clues. The Alphabet Murder. A series of gruesome murders shook the small towns outside Rochester, New York in the early 1970s, leaving a trail of terror and tragedy in its wake. Three young girls, Carmen Colon, Wanda Walkowicz, and Michelle Mayensa, were brutally abducted, strangled, and left in remote areas. Their bodies were found in towns that coincidentally matched their initials, giving rise to the name the Alphabet Murders, or Double Digit Murders. All three girls came from struggling families that were Catholic and had difficulty making friends. One was believed to have learning disabilities. They were all taken from their neighborhoods, just blocks from their homes. Carmen Colon, a 10-year-old Puerto Rican girl, was the first to vanish. She was last seen running away from a car on Route 490 West nude and waving her arms, but shockingly, no one stopped to help. Police Captain Andrew Sparacino expressed disbelief, stating that nobody stopped. He mentioned that people told them they were going too fast and were in a hurry to get home. Two days later, her lifeless body was found in a ditch, initially mistaken for a broken doll by the teenage boys who discovered her. The autopsy revealed the horrific truth. She had been assaulted and strangled by hand. In the spring of 1973, two young girls named Wanda Walkowicz and Michelle Mayenza, both 11 years old, disappeared from the streets of Rochester, New York. They were brutally murdered and their bodies were discovered in remote areas with unsettling similarities in their cases. Wanda, a tomboy with fiery red hair, was last seen walking home from the grocery store her bright spirit extinguished by a monstrous act. Her body was discovered the next day, fully clothed, at a rest area off State Route 104 in Webster. The autopsy revealed a horrific tale of strangulation, assault, and a sinister twist. She was fed before her murder. Michelle, a vulnerable soul, was tormented by her classmates and struggled to fit in. She was last seen leaving school in tears, her lifeless body found two days later in a ditch in Macedon. The autopsy told a similar story. Strangulation, assault, and a burger consumed before her death. The police were baffled by the similarities in the cases, with cat hair found on Wanda's clothes despite her family not owning a cat. An unknown visitor tended to Wanda's gravesite for 15 years, leaving flowers and a glimmer of hope that justice would be served. The investigation led to a possible suspect, described by witnesses as a man with dirty hands and a car with a flat tire. However, despite this lead, the cases were never solved, leaving the families and communities with a lingering sense of tragedy and injustice. The Zodiac Killer Infamous for his cryptic messages and gruesome murders, the Zodiac Killer has left a lasting impact on American criminal history. Despite killing five victims and injuring two others between 1966 and 1969, he brazenly claimed responsibility for up to 37 deaths. His modus operandi was as twisted as his messages, which included cryptographs and ciphers that taunted the police and public alike. The true identity of the Zodiac Killer remains unknown, 
although authorities have named only one suspect. His letters, filled with ominous motives, referenced gathering slaves for the afterlife. Out of his four ciphers, two remain unsolved, while one was deciphered in 2020. Despite the case being marked inactive and reactivated over the years, it continues to captivate the public due to its complexity. The Zodiac's last known correspondence was in 1974, leaving behind a trail of unsolved murders and unanswered questions. Despite the passage of time, his legend endures, a haunting reminder of the darkness that lurks in the shadows of human nature. Long Island Serial Killer the Gilgo Beach serial killings were a haunting and mysterious saga that played out along the shores of Long Island from 1996 to 2011. In a troubling discovery, the remains of 11 individuals were found at Gilgo Beach, a serene spot on New York's South Shore. The majority of the victims were sex workers who had advertised their services on Craigslist, which added a chilling dimension to the story. The person responsible for these terrible crimes became known as the Long Island Serial Killer. The media speculated about the identity of the Long Island Serial Killer. He was believed to be a white male aged 25 to 45, familiar with Long Island's South Shore and possibly with law enforcement ties. Investigators suspected he might have knowledge of police techniques and potentially had an accomplice. The case of the Long Island Serial Killer began with a desperate search for Shannon Gilbert, a 24-year-old woman who disappeared in May 2010. In a chilling 23 minutes 911 call, Shannon pleaded for help, saying, they are trying to kill me. Officer John Malia and his cadaver dog, Blue, launched a search for her in the gated beach community where she was last seen. However, these searches did not lead to any findings or clues about her whereabouts. Officer Malia also conducted a search near the parkway shoulder, using FBI data that suggested bodies are often discarded near roadways. Despite challenging conditions, Malia's dog picked up a scent, leading to the discovery of the skeleton of a woman named Melissa Barthelemy. She was found in a burlap bag. This find led to the discovery of three more bodies, and eventually, a total of 10 sets of remains were found, including those of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, Jessica Taylor, Valerie Mack, Karen Perez Vergata, and an unidentified toddler and Asian individual. The investigation suggested a single serial killer might be responsible, based on shared characteristics and forensic evidence. A reward was offered in 2011 and Shannon Gilbert's remains were finally found in December 2011. The Gilgo Beach serial killer case saw a breakthrough in 2014 with John Bitrolf's arrest for unrelated murders, followed by the FBI's involvement in 2015. In 2019, genetic genealogy was proposed to identify victims and the killer. Rex Hoyerman, a suspect in a string of murders, was arrested in 2020. The breakthrough in the case came with the discovery of a cryptic belt, which led investigators to Hoyerman. Upon his arrest, a disturbing array of evidence was uncovered, including items that hinted at a dark and sinister motif behind the killings. The investigation continues to seek justice for the victims of this notorious Long Island case. Bone Collector Between 2001 and 2005, the desert landscape of Albuquerque became a burial ground for at least 11 women. Their remains were discovered in 2009, sending shockwaves through the community and leaving law enforcement with an unsolved mystery. Christine Ross, a local resident, was out walking her dog when she stumbled upon a human femur bone. She sent a picture to her sister, a registered nurse, who confirmed the gruesome find. This discovery led detectives to uncover 11 graves containing the remains of two teenagers and nine adults. The victims, mostly Hispanic females aged 15 to 32, had disappeared between 2001 and 2005. Their lives were brutally cut short, leaving families shattered and a community scarred. What makes these murders even more chilling is that most victims had links to sex work leading investigators to suspect a serial killer dubbed the West Mesa Bone Collector. 
this predator targeted vulnerable women, leaving a trail of terror and despair. The Albuquerque Police Department and FBI launched a massive investigation, creating suspect profiles and analyzing evidence. Despite their expertise, the killer remained elusive, leaving detectives frustrated and families desperate for answers. A $100,000 reward was offered for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the West Mesa bone collector. But the killer's identity remains a mystery. Today, the West Mesa murders remain unsolved, leaving a trail of unanswered questions and shattered lives. But law enforcement refuses to give up, and the fight for justice continues. Servant Girl Annihilator The Servant Girl Annihilator, also referred to as the Austin Axe Murderer and the Midnight Assassin, was an unidentified serial killer who terrorized Austin, Texas, in 1884 and 1885. The cunning madman exhibited an obsession with targeting women, resulting in the deaths of seven women and one man. Additionally, six women and two men were injured in the attacks. The victims were all attacked indoors while asleep in their beds, with five women then dragged unconscious outside where they met their demise. Outdoors, three women suffered severe mutilation. A disturbing pattern emerged as all the victims were posed similarly, with six of the women having a sharp object inserted into their ears. The final victims, Eula Phillips, aged 17, and Susan Hancock, were two white women attacked while sleeping. Moses Hancock, Susan's husband, faced accusations but was acquitted shortly after. In the midst of the chaos, only one person, James Phillips, was convicted, but his conviction was later overturned. Meanwhile, London authorities even questioned American cowboys, including possibly Buck Taylor from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. In the midst of all this, 400 men were arrested in a year. Shockingly, some powerful figures refused to believe one person or group was responsible for these heinous acts. The fear among African Americans and voodoo practitioners heightened, with beliefs that the killer was a white man possessing supernatural invisibility. The spree finally came to a halt when additional police were hired, rewards were offered, and a vigilance committee was formed to patrol the streets at night. The murderers seemingly vanished from the scene, with no further attributed killings officially recognized by authorities. The Doodler San Francisco was gripped by fear as a mysterious serial killer, known as the Doodler, targeted gay nightclubs, bars, and restaurants in the early 1970s. The unidentified black man, estimated to be between 19 and 23 years old, had a distinctive method of operation. He would draw sketches of his victims before fatally stabbing them. All of his victims were white males, and when their bodies were found, they showed similar stab wounds that bore the gruesome signature of the doodler. The killer's ability to blend in and strike at random left police puzzled. The series of attacks began with a grim discovery at San Francisco's Ocean Beach in the early hours of January 27, 1974. The body of Gerald Earl Cavanaugh, a 49-year-old Canadian-American immigrant, lay stabbed multiple times at the water's edge. Cavanaugh had put up a fight against his attacker, evident from the self-defense wounds he bore. Months later, on June 25, 1974, Joseph Stevens, a 27-year-old female impersonator and comedian, was found dead near Spreckles Lake. It appeared Stevens had been alive when near the lake, suggesting he might have encountered his killer there. Subsequently, on July 7, 1974, Klaus Achim Klaus Christmann, a 31-year-old German-American immigrant, was similarly murdered at Ocean Beach. His death was notably more violent, characterized by multiple stab wounds and throat slashes. In April 1975, Warren Andrews, a 52-year-old lawyer, was discovered unconscious at Land's End succumbing to his injuries weeks later. His case added to the string of killings clustered near Ocean Beach. A month later, on May 12, 1975, Frederick Elmer Kappen, a 32-year-old nurse and Navy veteran, was found stabbed with signs his body had been moved. 
His identification through fingerprints tied him to the growing list of victims. Lastly, Harold Gullberg, a 66-year-old Swedish-American immigrant, was found decomposed in Lincoln Park on June 4, 1975. Although differing in some details, Gullberg is believed to be the final confirmed victim of the doodler. These cases, marked by similar brutal methods, baffled law enforcement for years. The killer's apparent ability to strike at random, targeting victims from diverse backgrounds and professions, continues to be a haunting mystery that persists unresolved to this day. The police once had a suspect in their sights, a young man they strongly believed was responsible for a series of murders and attacks. However, they hit a roadblock when the surviving victims, including a well-known entertainer and a diplomat, chose not to testify in court, fearing exposure of their personal lives. Despite the suspect's cooperation during questioning, he never confessed to the crimes. Consequently, he was never brought to trial or convicted. To this day, the identity of this suspect remains undisclosed, and very little information about the case is available to the public. In February 2019, police offered a $100 reward for any information leading to the apprehension of the killer. They also released a revised sketch of what the suspect might look like four decades later. Today, this case remains active within the San Francisco Police Department, with recent advancements in DNA technology providing new hope. Authorities are determined to bring closure to this chilling mystery, actively pursuing leads and utilizing innovative tools to solve the case. Bible John In the vibrant nightlife of late 1960s, Glasgow, Scotland, series of murders unfolded forever linked to a mysterious figure known as Bible John. This elusive serial killer claimed the lives of three young women with dark hair, aged between 25 and 32, all of whom crossed paths with their killer at the iconic Barrowland Ballroom. The infamous Bible John acquired his nickname from his chilling habit of quoting scripture and condemning adultery during his encounters with victims. The city of Glasgow was shocked by the murder of Patricia Docker, a 25-year-old nurse and mother whose body was found in a garage doorway. Patricia had suffered extensive injuries and was strangled. Her personal belongings were missing, but some were later recovered from nearby water sources. In the course of the investigation, a witness recalled hearing a disturbing scream on the night before Patricia's body was found. Patricia had spent her final evening at a dance hall, but her change of plans was unknown to her family. Decades later, Patricia's murder remains unsolved, leaving her loved one he's still yearning for justice. The post-mortem, conducted by Gilbert Forbes at the University of Glasgow Medical School, revealed that Patricia Docker's cause of death was strangulation, with no evidence of assault. Riger Mortis indicated she likely died shortly after leaving the Barrowland Ballroom. Investigators believed her attacker had grabbed her, punched, and kicked her in the face as she screamed for help before ultimately strangling her and leaving her naked body near a garage doorway. Jemima McDonald, a 31-year-old mother of three, was murdered in August 1969 after a night out at the Barrow Lynn Ballroom, where she was last seen leaving with a well-dressed man with a Glaswegian accent and distinctive mannerisms. Her body was found in a derelict building raped, beaten, and strangled. Initially, her case wasn't linked to the earlier murder of Patricia Docker, despite similarities including both being at the same venue and being menstruating. The investigation into Patricia's murder had gone cold, and McDonald's case also yielded no leads. However, when Helen Pudock was murdered similarly on October 1969, police released a composite drawing of the suspect and surveilled the Barrowland Ballroom, but failed to catch the killer. The murders shared chilling similarities, including the victims being menstruating and the killer's modus operandi, which intensified efforts to apprehend the perpetrator. Bible John. Helen Puttock and her sister encountered two men named John at the Barrowland Ballroom the night before Helen's murder. They spent over an hour together before departing. One John claimed to be a slater from Castle Milk, 
while the other was articulate and critical of dance halls, referring to them as dens of iniquity. During a taxi ride home, Langford, Hudick, and the second John discussed his strict upbringing and disdain for alcohol. Langford described him as tall, slim, well-dressed, with reddish or fair hair, aged between 25 and 30. He frequently quoted the Old Testament and disapproved of married women attending dance halls. Langford told detectives that the man with puttock was tall and slim, wore a well-cut brown reed and tailor suit, smoked cigarettes, and mentioned knowing drinking places in the Yoka district and having worked in a laboratory. She described his facial features, including overlapping front teeth. However, bouncers at the Barrowland Ballroom disputed this description, saying the man was short and well-spoken with black hair. The suspect was last spotted disembarking from abuse at 2 a.m. on October 31st, appearing with mudstains and a red mark under his eye, heading towards a public ferry. Helen Puttock's murder echoed the striking patterns of the two previous killings. Each victim was a mother who met her killer at the Barrowland Ballroom, had her handbag stolen, was strangled, and was taken advantage of. All were murdered near their homes shortly after being escorted back, and each was menstruating, with her sanitary items placed nearby, suggesting that refusal to engage in intimate act may have triggered the killings. In 1970, additional artists' impressions and the PhotoFit system were used for the first time in Scotland, but no breakthroughs emerged despite extensive efforts, including thousands of witness statements and identity parades. The investigation involved over a hundred detectives working full-time and questioning more than 5,000 potential suspects. Jean Langford attended numerous identity parades without success, and detectives even mingled in dance halls particularly the Barrow Land, to prevent further attacks. As the investigation into Bible John reached a dead end, officers considered possibilities like the suspect's death, imprisonment, or relocation. Despite widespread circulation of the suspect's description, no leads emerged. In 1969, a strong suspect was identified based on behavior and resemblance, but was released due to a dental mismatch. Later DNA testing also cleared this individual as a suspect. The Bible John case, a notorious Scottish serial killer investigation, remains unsolved despite a large-scale inquiry and a composite sketch of the suspect. A convicted serial killer, Peter Tobin, was considered a potential suspect, but was later ruled out. In the pursuit of the truth behind the Gilgo Beach murders, a breakthrough emerged when a body language expert dissected the physical behavior and features of Rex Hoyerman, the alleged perpetrator. This renowned expert in nonverbal cues identified chilling red flags in Hoyerman's demeanor, revealing a sinister narrative. The expert uncovered subtle yet telling signs through meticulous observation, fleeting glances, tense posture, and involuntary twitches. Each nuance spoke volumes about Hoyerman's true intentions. The expert also analyzed features that betrayed underlying motives, a lingering gaze, a tight jawline, and a twitching hand. These insights sparked new leads in the investigation, offering a glimpse into the mind of a potential killer. As the case unfolded, the body language expert's analysis captivated both investigators and the public, raising a haunting question. What other secrets might be hiding behind Hoyerman's carefully crafted facade? Let us know in the comments. River City Killer A wave of terror swept through Little Rock, Arkansas, as a series of brutal stabbings left the community reeling in fear and confusion. Between 2020 and 2021, three innocent lives were claimed, and one victim barely survived the attacks. Despite the valiant efforts of law enforcement, the elusive killer remains at large, casting a dark shadow over the city. The first victim, 64-year-old Larry Eugene McChristian, was found brutally murdered on a stranger's porch on August 24, 2020. Surveillance footage captured the horrific attack, but the killer's identity remained a mystery. Just a month later, 60-year-old Jeff Welch was discovered dead on his front porch, 
confirming the presence of a serial killer. After a brief period of silence, the city was struck by another wave of violence on April 11, 2021. Deborah Walker, a 41-year-old woman, was brutally attacked and stabbed 15 times, miraculously surviving her injuries. Her courage in providing crucial information about her assailant helped investigators piece together the puzzle. Less than 24 hours later, 40-year-old Marlon Anthony Franklin was found stabbed to death, further solidifying the connection between the cases. The Little Rock Police Department, in collaboration with the FBI's behavioral analysis team, concluded that these chilling attacks were the work of a single offender. The killer targeted strangers walking alone in the early hours of the morning, between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. Despite increased police patrols and a $220,000 reward, the suspect remains at large, leaving the community on edge. Following the chilling murders in Little Rock, the police launched a relentless investigation to bring the perpetrator to justice. After the discovery of the fourth victim, Marlon Anthony Franklin, the authorities officially concluded that a singular offender likely committed these heinous crimes. This revelation sent shockwaves through the community and the realization dawned that a serial killer was at large. Despite the community's determination and the relentless pursuit of justice, the identity of the Little Rock serial killer remains a mystery. The case remains open and law enforcement continues to follow leads and explore every avenue to apprehend the suspect. The city of Little Rock stands united, refusing to let fear define them as they await the day when the elusive killer will be brought to justice. The people of Little Rock continue to stand strong, supporting each other through the darkest of times. As the investigation unfolds, one question remains. Will justice prevail and the killer be brought to account for their heinous crimes? Only time will tell, but one thing is certain. The city of Little Rock will not rest until the truth is revealed and the killer is brought to justice. Smiley Face Murder In the heartland of the Midwest, a disturbing mystery awaited discovery. The smiley face murder theory, led by retired NYC detectives Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, along with criminal justice expert Dr. Lee Gilbertson, reveals a chilling truth. 45 young men discovered deceased in bodies of water across various states. From the late 1990s to 2010 were not accidental drowning victims, but rather the victims of one or more deliberate serial killers. The theory got its name because smiley face graffiti was found near the locations where bodies were discovered in several cases. Gannon wrote a textbook case study called Case Studies in Drowning Forensics about this theory. However, law enforcement and other experts have generally responded to this theory with skepticism. As recently as 2017, Gannon and Duarte were revisiting evidence from the late 1990s connecting the deaths of these 45 college-age males, whose bodies were often recovered from the water after leaving parties or bars where they had been drinking. According to the former detectives, these men typically fit a profile of being popular, athletic, and successful students, most of whom were white. Gannon and Duarte proposed the theory that these young men were murdered, either by an individual or a group of killers. However, other law enforcement agencies investigating these deaths reject the idea that the cases are linked. The police departments involved do not currently believe the deaths, where smiley faces were found at the scenes, indicate serial killer activity. For example, the La Crosse, Wisconsin Police Department, overseeing eight of these cases, determined the deaths were accidental drownings of intoxicated men and reported no discovery of smiley face symbols linked to these incidents. Additionally, the Center for Homicide Research published a research brief attempting to scientifically refute the theory. Criminal profiler Pat Brown dismisses the serial killer theory as ludicrous, arguing that the evidence does not align with known patterns of serial killers. Brown believes the smiley face symbols found in some cases are likely coincidental and merely represent guesses about where the bodies entered the water with smiley face graffiti being discovered only after extensive searches. 
The Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI issued a statement indicating that after reviewing the information provided by two retired police detectives regarding the incidents and interviewing an individual who had shared information with these detectives, no evidence had been found to support connections between these tragic deaths or to substantiate the theory that these deaths were the result of a serial killer or group of killers. The majority of these incidents appeared to be alcohol-related drownings. The FBI stated that it would continue to collaborate with local law enforcement in the affected areas and provide support upon request. Babysitter Killer A serial killer known as the Babysitter Killer or Oakland County Child Killer murdered at least four children in Oakland County, Michigan. The first victim was a 12-year-old Mark Stebbins, who disappeared on February 15, 1976, and was found dead four days later in a snowbank. He had been assaulted, strangled, and tied up. The second victim, a 12-year-old Jill Robinson, ran away from home on December 22 after an argument with her mother. Her body was found on December 26 along Interstate 75, with half her face blown off by a shotgun. Both bodies were carefully placed in public view, with the victims fully clothed and showing signs of assault. In 1977, two more children fell victim to the babysitter killer. On January 2nd, 10-year-old Christine Mihelik was abducted from a 7-Eleven store and found dead 19 days later. Around March that same year, 11-year-old Timothy King was taken from a drugstore parking lot and found dead six days later, assaulted and suffocated. Both bodies were carefully placed in public view, with Timothy's body found with his skateboard and wearing neatly pressed clothes. The babysitter killer's modus operandi involved abducting children, holding them captive for 4 to 19 days, sexually assaulting them, and murdering them through shooting or smothering. The killer would then place the bodies in public locations, often posed in a specific manner, as seen in the cases of Christine and Timothy. After Timothy's death, a psychiatrist named Dr. Bruce Danto received a letter from an anonymous writer named Allen, who claimed to be the accomplice of the Oakland County Chill Killer, known as Frank. Allen described Frank's traumatic experiences in the Vietnam War and his desire for revenge against affluent citizens. He offered to provide evidence in exchange for immunity, but never showed up to the meeting. The investigation considered several suspects, including Archibald Edward Sloan, a pedophile whose car hair samples matched two victims, and John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown. But DNA tests ruled him out. Theodore Lamborghini, a retired auto worker, was also a top suspect but refused to take a polygraph test. The case remained unsolved, but new interest emerged when Timothy King's family sought information about a man named Chris Bush, who had been in police custody for child pornography before Timothy's abduction. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.